So welcome everybody to the first of what we hope will be um, a regular series on the methodological challenges and approaches of COVID-19 um, hosted by us at the UK Health um, Security Agency and the JDC element and in partnership with our colleagues from Turing and the Royal Statistical Society. Um, and today's event, just as an introduction, is really about partnerships. And um, so we are here today because we are in partnership with, with Turing and the Royal Statistical Society um, and able to bring some of the, the best minds and the best thinking on the COVID situation to us in these forums. And I look forward to, to welcoming Mark um, to us uh, very soon. But just to give a, a small introduction um, to who we are and what we do. So we are the UK Health Security Agency, a brand new agency that was announced on the, the 24th of March this year. And we will become the country's permanent standing capacity to plan, prevent and respond to the external health threats. And of course, the initial phase of the operation is the ongoing fight for COVID um, and we'll harness the UK's health protection, science, intelligence, testing and delivery expertise. For those of you who are familiar with the, the UK health context, this brings together Public Health England, the Test and Trace Service run by NHS and the Joint Biosecurity Centre. Um, by bringing these three organisations together, um, we'll have a leading capability of data analytics and genomic surveillance and we'll add scale to the testing and contact tracing that we've set up over the past year. The focus of the new organisation will be in five areas. It will be on prevention, detection, analysis, responding and, and leading. And of course, with all that comes a really strong emphasis on data, data science and advanced analytics. And we're really here to celebrate some of the partnerships that we've developed over this time. So the Joint Biosecurity Centre, which is an element of this new organisation, has developed a strategic partnership framework, which helps us to manage our strategic partners um, together. So we can see the Turing and the Royal Statistical Society, and we're going to build on what we've learned in this partnership um, and take this forward to be able to ensure that we bring the best and the brightest minds close to us as we tackle this particular epidemic, but also how we think about health protection for the UK going forwards. And with regard to our, our relationship with Turing, you know, I thank Chris Holmes and our colleagues for allowing us to, to lean on you over the past year, to pull the ideas out of your heads, to have you close to us in, in our darkest moments of, of developing new analytical and modeling capability within our very new systems and helping us on that transition journey to understand um, both the epidemiological and the data science challenges that we take forwards. And um, some of our other partnerships to mention. So we work really closely with um, the um, Office for National Statistics, and we've developed what we call the local data spaces, which is just coming out of pilot at the moment. This is um, an initiative where we can couple expertise in analysis and data science um, to be able to link multiple government data sets together and help to make evidence-based local decision-making for health protection. Another area that's come out of um, the Joint Biosecurity Centre is the environmental monitoring for health protection, which is infamously known internally as the wastewater programme, where we test sewage for traces of the COVID-19 variant. Um, and we're now able to use that as an early warning indicator. This is a project that's running with DEFRA, our devolved administrations, the Environment Agency, CFAS, and academia and the water companies. And this sets, these partnerships are set within the wider context and agenda of the greater use of data for decision making within government, of which health is now taking a healthy stride um, with the forthcoming NHSX health and social care data strategy, which will lead the direction of travel for health and analytics and the systems that support those and um, into this sector as we move forward with the development of our new organisation. So that's us. But without further ado, I'm really pleased to see so many of you here today and to hear um, our, our lecture with our, our visiting speaker. And Professor Mark Lipstitch is the Professor of Epidemiology and Director for the Centre of Communicable Disease Dynamics at Harvard and TH Chan School of Public Health. Mark is a, an international recognised expert in epidemiological methods and disease transmission modelling and is being a leading scientific authority in the COVID-19 pandemic. And today he's going to discuss two of his major data projects that he's been involved in over the past year, 
The first looking at the identified elevated risk of long-term clinical events for adults who contracted COVID-19. And in the second, looking at vaccines in a nationwide mass vaccination setting. Mark, I'm so pleased that you can join us today. I'm really looking forward to hearing your lecture um, and to learning more about the really important and interesting work that you've done and influenced in this sector. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's really an honor to be at a, a talk sponsored by such uh, distinguished organizations. And, um, and it's especially interesting to hear a little bit about the JBC because among other reasons, because uh, our country is also in the process, I think of setting up something along similar lines. And uh, I look forward to learning more about what works uh, in the UK uh, as potentially a way to inform what's happening in this country as well. Um, so this is my, my original title. Um, and uh, uh, I want to start by acknowledging the really enormous team of people uh, at our uh, institution and collaborators um, who have been uh, working hard since February of last year. So almost 14 months or so. Uh, on various aspects of COVID-19, and I'll highlight, I actually decided to do three and go a little broader and not a, quite as deep, uh, just to, to maybe broaden the interest, um, but uh, I'll be highlighting work by a number of these people along the way. Um, I think perhaps a better title, had I, had I uh, been thinking harder, would have been something like this, Why COVID is Hard to Study why it matters and some approaches to dealing with the challenges. That's really what I'm gonna talk about. Um, uh, I think the, the starting point is that good decisions need good evidence. And um, uh, this graphic is uh, an updated version of a graphic that a bunch of us put together um, following a, a debrief on the 2009 flu pandemic in 2011, and then it was redone to be a little bit more, uh, look less like PowerPoint and more like uh, professional <laughs> in, in this more recent publication. Um, but, the, but the idea is that surveillance and epidemiology are the building blocks of evidence. And there are a number of questions that in any pandemic uh, we need evidence on, such as transmissibility, severity per case, um, contributions, contributing factors to severity, um, uh, the expected timing and duration of epidemics, the number infected so far, et cetera. And then these, uh, these kinds of evidence can inform better decisions uh, on questions like the overall scale of response, the selection of um, measures for direct and indirect protection, and so forth. And ideally, uh, a rationally designed system would take account of what we want to decide, then what evidence we need to make those decisions, and then how we're going to get that evidence. Um, and I think uh, in the design of institutions for pandemic preparedness and response, that would be the ideal. The reality, as you all know, is much messier, um, but it's at least helpful to think in terms of that ideal uh, when we when we are designing surveillance systems. Um, I, I want to state the hypothesis that the lack of timely and compelling evidence has led to some to worse decisions uh, during the COVID pandemic. And I state it as a hypothesis because I think there's some support for it, but uh, it, we need not look very far to find other contributing factors uh, to poor decision making. Uh, um, and uh, I won't elaborate. I think you can imagine what I'm referring to, but, uh, but evidence is at least necessary, if not sufficient, to make good decisions. Um, so as a couple of examples, this is a picture I took in a park in one of the most uh, depressed city, towns in, the, in Massachusetts where I live, uh, in the state where I live, town of Adams, which shut its parks um, because there was, uh, inadequate evidence to suggest that parks were safe to keep open. Um, that was taken about um, uh, three weeks ago. They're still closed. Um, 
uh, with consequences for uh, you know for people's ability to have recreation, to see green, uh, and to and to uh, improve their mental and physical health. Um, these are pictures from the New York Times taken in March of last year. Um, and, uh, and one is a picture of the mayor doing a fist bump, which, you know, is probably better than, than shaking hands, but probably is not much of, a, of a, a contributor to transmission one way or the other. And on the other hand, having a very crowded, unventilated room full of people with no masks to have their meetings uh, at the height of the um, problem in New York City. So I think uh, those sort of personal and small scale decisions were made uh, suboptimally because we didn't understand uh, a lot about the virus. Um, there were other things we didn't understand and in some cases still uh, don't understand and in many cases we now do. Um, the extent of early spread, the value of masks, the locations and routes of transmission, the role of children in schools, the identification of high risk groups, um, uh, and, and other, other aspects are just some examples where better evidence could have allowed us both to control the virus better and to have some aspects of our lives less disrupted um, by choosing interventions not on the precautionary principle but based on, uh, on evidence that there really is a, a need. And I'm all in favor, of course, of precautionary um, actions when you don't have evidence, but the point is to get evidence at the same time that you're doing the precautionary actions. Um, I, I have it, the, la the last bullet here is the need for a repressive isolation policy. Um, this uh, graph that was published from the Wuhan data in the Journal of the American Medical Association shows the uh, interpretation of the scientists who did it um, that, uh, that only at the point in Wuhan where, uh, where um, centralized quarantine, which is a nice way of saying taking people against their will out of their homes and putting them in a centralized place uh, for quarantine is uh, only when that was implemented did the reproduction number as measured by this paper go below one. And uh, that led to articles, uh, opinion articles in the New York Times, one article at least, um, and widespread efforts in several states, luckily of all of them rebuffed um, in the United States to um, implement uh, um, quarantine of people outside their homes against their will. Um, and it turned out that this was in fact an error in the, in the um, interpretation of the data, um, you misusing a, a method uh, developed uh, by perhaps some people on this call or their collaborators uh, to estimate the reproduction number um, and where the timing obviously is very sensitive um, of where that line crosses one. And uh, they misunderstood what they were doing and ended up um, fueling efforts for what I consider a really unfortunate, uh, but fortunately avoided policy. So if this general hypothesis is correct, the lack of, uh, the, then methodological advances to improve the quality of evidence will save lives and improve lives in future pandemics. Toward that end, uh, a number of us have been uh, putting a lot of effort during this pandemic into uh, trying to find uh, ways to uh, or sources of bias that can enter studies uh, of, of observational studies, mainly of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, and also ways to, to avoid them. And these are three of the, um, of the publications that I'll refer to and, and talk about. Um, and uh, the, the first one um, by Emma Corsi and, and uh, several of us in the group looks at these four or four, four, uh, four or five uh, topics. And then the last one uh, looks at the question of epidemic trends. Um, and I'm happy to share these slides if people can't read these citations. Um, so to summarize what a lot of that work got to, it, it identified several common challenges in COVID-19 epidemiology and observational studies um, and some solutions. Um, I won't go through all of these in a lot of detail, um, but I will focus a little bit on representativeness. Um, I think uh, this is 
what epidemiologists consider gold, representative samples. And um, I think there's less appreciation in other fields of data science um, because you can do more with unrepresentative data in other field in some other fields um, than in epidemiology. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I think surveillance in the United States in particular has really suffered from a lack of representativeness. Um, in 2009, during the flu, and again in, in 2020, uh, a number of us spent a lot of hours trying to figure out, okay, we don't have any way to get a random sample of the population, so are we going to use uh, the National Guard or the Army or the post office or the um, or parking lots in, in um, grocery stores or emergency departments to get some kind of nearly random sample um, uh, in order to estimate prevalence, incidence, or, uh, or, or um, other, or seroprevalence. And um, I think the UK and Spain and some other countries have strong offices of national statistics that were able to, to do that. Uh, we did not. Um, and I think that from our perspective in the US is to me the, the, the really starting point um, of, of getting our surveillance in better shape for the next time um, and our epidemiology. But there are also another of a, a number of other issues that I'll, I'll talk about some of um, in what I next say. Um, I think the, the pandemic has shown something that probably uh, most people already believed. I was a, a bit of a skeptic about uh, because of the representativeness problems uh, of, of the ways in which big data can help. Um, and I'm becoming more of a believer in the value of big data. Um, uh, and I, I've become aware that um, there are really at least three important dimensions of big data that are of different values and different endeavors. And I'll try to talk about that in the examples I give. Um, one is the number of individuals. Another is the number of variables and the level of detail in which you observe an individual. And a third is the duration for which you observe an individual. And all of these can be valuable uh, in various ways. Um, so I'm gonna talk about three case studies, uh, one on the epidemic trend and the reproduction number, one on vaccine effectiveness uh, in practice and, uh, and against infection and infectiousness and one on uh, the post-acute sequelae. So the first example, or the first question is, what is the epidemic trend uh, or the reproduction number? And here, the, the main challenge, or a main challenge, is that testing is changing over time. And you're well aware of this. Uh, it affected every country badly. Um, and, and it's both a changing testing is a cause of changing case numbers, because if you look more, you find more, and also an effect of the changes in the true number of cases. Um, and nobody, uh, with the possible example of this paper by David Fisman and colleagues, has proposed, to my knowledge, a way to correct for testing frequency um, very well in, in estimating how many cases there are each day. Um, and so when you see increased case numbers, that could be real, it could be a test artifact or both. So I want to talk about a, a preprint that's led by um, uh, several colleagues um, in our center uh, that approaches this by using viral loads to infer the time from infection distribution and from that to infer the growth or decline of the epidemic. And you can do that on a cross section or multiple cross sections in a way that's not sensitive to the testing fraction. There are two key ideas in this approach. The first is that viral load in COVID-19 or in SARS-CoV-2 infection peaks early and declines slowly. That means that if you observe a high viral load, you are very likely observing a young infection, a recent infection. And if you see a low viral load, you're, you're very likely observing an older infection that happened uh, some days in the past. Uh, you might be observing a very new infection, but you're more likely given the, the, the trajectories to be observing an old infection. So that's the first key idea. And then the second idea is an, you know, a century old or so idea that growing populations are mostly young and shrinking populations are mostly old. Um, that's the sort of uh, notion of the Euler-Lotka equation 
it's just basic demographic theory. That's why uh, um, the demographic transition means lower population growth and lower, um, uh, lower numbers of children relative to older people. Um, and we can say the same thing about uh, viral epidemics. So this is a very complicated figure, but I'll walk through it a little bit from this preprint um, from James Hay and Lee Kennedy Schaffer and, and Michael Minna um, as <clears throat> leaders of the project. This is simulated data. So you have uh, an epidemic curve with incidents going up and down. That has a, a reproduction number that's declining as, as susceptible people get used up. Um, uh, this is some traject some viral trajectories of the individuals in the epidemic sampled from that epidemic. And the, the key idea is that, and this is, um, this is the uh, distribution of viral loads among people sampled at the beginning of the epidemic, uh, sorry, uh, the distribution of the time since infection of people sampled at the beginning of the epidemic in the middle of the epidemic and towards the declining part. And as I stated earlier, in a growing uh, population, in this case, viral epidemic population, most infections are young. And as the epidemic gets older and begins to shrink, most infections are old. That means that the viral loads are mostly uh, high viral loads. This is CT value on an inverse scale. So see, low number CT is high viral load. So that means that the average viral load is going down and also the shape of the distribution is changing. So if you then take these simulated data and look um, at as the epidemic progresses from day zero, uh, sorry, from day 50 to day 75 to day 100, the growth rate is declining uh, and the um, average days since infection is increasing. That's these green lines. Um, given this relationship between the days since infection and the average viral load, then <clears throat> you get that as the growth rate is high, the average viral load is high. As the growth rate is low, the average viral load is low. And then you get a relationship between the average CT uh, um, or viral load and the reproduction number um, where a fast growing one is high. These, that's the red points here. And a fast shrinking one is green low uh, down here. And it also is reflected in the skewness of the distribution of CT values. If you look at data with this uh, approach, you find that again, you get this relationship. Uh, well, let's start here. This is the R of T, the reproduction number inferred from, um, from case data. And you have, uh, it's positive early on. It's, it goes down, it goes back up above one. Uh, and then fluctuates around one uh, in, until it starts to stay steadily above one. Um, this is the viral load uh, distributions, which are again, uh, when the growth is high, the viral loads are high. When growth is low or decline is happening, the viral loads are low. And when you process that uh, through details, which I'll leave you to read if you're interested, um, into a relative probability of an infection happening at any time during this curve, um, based on the viral loads alone, you get, uh, you get this shape of epidemic, which is consistent with the broad shape uh, of, of what we see in case observations. And over here, oh, sorry, I'm pointing on the wrong part of the slide. I apologize. Over here, uh, you, um, you see a... Uh, a relationship between the CT-based estimate um, and the uh, and the case-based estimate that when at least the the sign of it, the whether it's greater than one or less than one, um, is quite consistent between those two methods, and that's data from Massachusetts. We also apply it to to other settings. So, in summary, CT values uh, or viral loads can provide a cross-sectional estimate of epidemic growth 
that, that gets around the problem of changing test frequencies. And it does even better if you have uh, multiple um, uh, cross-sectional data. From the data science perspective, I think uh, uh, there's often a um, tendency to report only positivity versus neg negative uh, results from PCR tests. CT is not usually reported, uh, and that's on purpose because they don't want clinicians to misuse it. It's a doctor proofing mechanism, um, but it is very valuable to have it uh, just as the concentration of antibodies and measurements uh, and other measurements are often dichotomized also for clinician proofing purposes. Um, it's, it's actually for epidemiology purposes, it's really valuable uh, to have uh, those raw data um, and be able to extract them readily for analysis. Um, uh, and, and then of course, the other input that I didn't emphasize enough uh, is that we need data on viral load trajectories in order to calibrate this model. Um, so in the sort of dimensions of big data, this is a, an example that's really focused on the number of variables and the level of detail. So the second example is, is related to vaccine effectiveness. Um, and this really uh, addresses two challenges. The first is uh, the problem, the old epidemiological problem of confounding when a vaccine is being rolled out, uh, maybe especially when it's rolled out fast, those who do and don't get it are not very are not entirely comparable, and so you risk uh, attributing to the vaccine differences that are just between the types of people who get the vaccine and don't. Um, and then with the infectiousness and infection outcome, um, the problem is that most of the RCTs had outcomes that included symptoms as a criterion for case ascertainment. And vaccine effectiveness or efficacy from such studies is not interpretable as an impact on all infections or on transmission, which is of, of importance for uh, understanding how to use the vaccine. So the first challenge is confounding, and that's that many factors pre predict both whether you get vaccine uh, and what, whether you're at risk of infection. I've listed some of them here. Um, and therefore the differences in the outcome um, may be due to some factor that's not the vaccine itself, but just a, a predictor of the vaccine. Um, I had the privilege to work with uh, a group led by Danny Feiken and Manel Patel that put out this uh, guidance uh, last month on um, how to evaluate vaccine effectiveness. Um, I think it's the most comprehensive guide that I'm aware of uh, to these kinds of studies and to the potential pitfalls uh, and ways to address them. Um, uh, and confounding is not the only challenge. Uh, this is the table of potential sources of bias and how to correct them uh, from the table. And that's even before we start talk, thinking about variants. There's an addendum coming that will talk about variants. So it's not the only one, but it's the one that I'll, I'll just talk about today for reasons of time. But I refer you to that document because I think it's a it's really helpful um, look at the at the general issue. Um, this is a slide from uh, screenshotted from my collaborator uh, Ron Balasir in in Israel, um, just as an illustration of the extent of confounding that that may uh, occur in this case by social class. So. Um, in Israel, they have 10 deciles of social class that they uh, assign people to. Um, and if you look at the um, vaccine uptake uh, among the better off people, it's, uh, it's high at this moment in, in early in the vaccine campaign in Israel. Um, if you look at the uh, lowest uh, socioeconomic status, it's way lower, considerably lower. Um, and on the right, unfortunately, a little bit blocked, uh, are the um, proportion of those social classes that had had a COVID diagnosis up till then, so a proxy of risk. And you can see a, a very strong um, relationship uh, in the other direction. So if you didn't account for this in any way, um, you, would, uh, you would find a lot more vaccinated and uh, people who had not been uh, infected in this group 
and a lot more unvaccinated people who had been infected in this group. So even if the vaccine did nothing, you would, you would uh, expect to infer um, a, a benefit to the vaccine. So that, that's an old problem, but, uh, but a particularly uh, intense one um, in this case. So in working with that group at, led by Ron Balasser at the Kali Research Institute in Israel, um, as the vaccine was being rolled out, uh, we conducted a cohort study where each individual at the time of vaccination was matched on a number of factors, um, uh, some of which, uh, many of which tracked uh, probability of getting vaccinated and also probability of, uh, um, of infection. <clears throat> and, uh, and each individual was matched to a, a person who had not yet been vaccinated um, along these many criteria. Um, and then I think the innovative part was that um, there were lots of potential criteria to use, but uh, what we did was to choose the matching criteria as the smallest list that would produce a null result in the first 12 days. Uh, as the randomized controlled trial showed. So the idea there is, um, is that uh, the randomized trial had shown that the vaccine takes about 12 days between the day you get it and the day you're, uh, you're observed to, to, to begin having a lower rate of, uh, of detected infections, um, uh, perhaps due, due to the delay, both first in the immune response being generated and then in the incubation time for, uh, for symptoms to show up. So by using that RCT result, we were able to calibrate our matching uh, to, to uh, see how well we had eliminated confounding. Um, and so as, to illustrate that, we, uh, we looked at the, um, the Kaplan-Meier curves of the, in, the outcome happening in vaccinated and unvaccinated people um, over the first uh, 12 days. So that ends here. And they were uh, indistinguishable from one another in the, in the analysis that we actually performed. But for sort of pedagogical reasons, we also looked what happens if you, uh, if you only match on age and sex and you see uh, to my surprise, they're not as divergent as you might expect, given uh, given the descriptions I just showed you. Um, but uh, but they they are more divergent. So we use this negative control uh, outcome in a way, which is the an outcome that you expect to be unaffected by the vaccine, as a way of calibrating whether we were uh, adequately controlling for confounding. The results are published and and have gotten a lot of attention, so you probably know them, but, um, but they showed results uh, of uh, reduced um, uh, documented infections, symptomatic infections, hospitalization, severe COVID, uh, and, uh, and death due to COVID, um, uh, although the death uh, was not statistically distinguishable. It's certainly suggestive in the, um, in the publication. And, um, and it was also possible given the, the almost 600,000 um, vaccinated individuals to, to do subgroup analyses that weren't previously possible. And so, uh, for example, the 70 year olds had a 98% estimated vaccine efficacy with reasonably tight confidence bounds. Um, and those with one or two comorbidities, uh, no evidence of reduced effect possible evidence of reduced effect in those uh, with three or more comorbidities. Oops. Um, another challenge is the impact on, uh, is to try to measure the impact of vaccines on infection and infectiousness. Um, that's, uh, that's important because we want to know how well we can use the vaccines for herd immunity, how much we can count on my vaccine protecting uh, someone that I'm in contact with. So for individual and collective decision-making, it's an important question. Um, so uh, with Rebecca Khan, we've, uh, we've provided some suggested approaches for doing this. Um, uh, and there's still um, 
work in progress on on incorporating viral load, but just uh, but just with the question of whether someone is infected or not, um, uh, our approach that we suggest in this preprint is that testing based on symptoms or on a combination of symptoms and other reasons, such as contact with an infected person, can't estimate the impact on infection. Um, it, it gives a, a mixed and hard to interpret VE vaccine effectiveness estimate. But vaccine effectiveness from cross-sectional testing of a random sample of the population adequate, accurately estimates the effectiveness against viral positivity, a prevalence measure, which is not the usual way that we, we test vaccines, um, but which has been pioneered by other people uh, in pneumococcal vaccine studies. Um, and then vaccine effectiveness among those exposed to infection, say through contact tracing, provides a valid estimate of the vaccine effectiveness conditional on exposure against infection. Um, and that's an old idea from, from Halloran et al. Um, uh, as well. So, um, so if you are interested in these questions about how well the vaccine works and whether it's going to contribute, how much it's going to contribute to herd immunity. There are sort of three flavors of, of effect you might be interested in. Um, preventing infection or reducing the susceptibility of someone to infection, reducing how long they're infectious, and reducing how much virus they shed. Um, and we've mapped out the sort of study designs that can give you insight into each of these. Um, I won't go through the whole whole uh, graph here, but um, it's essential to, the key point is that it's essential to analyze separately cases that are ascertained for different reasons, which may be symptoms, which may be sort of cross-sectional testing of a sample of the population, or which may be testing of exposed people. And the, the tricky part is that if you combine these, uh, you get a, a harder a measure that's hard to interpret. So with a collaborators um, in, uh, in Israel, different collaborators in Israel at Sheba Medical Center, um, we applied that approach um, in a preprint uh, that's available here um, and estimated that fully vaccinated people were 65% less likely to have infections conditional on exposure and 70% less likely to have a CT value less than 30, so a, a high viral load infection um, given that they were exposed. With, this was among healthcare workers, so it was a large cohort, but not as large as the nationwide cohort. Um, so the confidence bounds are, are wide. And I will say that um, uh, we, we were hoping that the, uh, that the early sign, that the early period uh, would be truly null um, in the same way that it was with the, um, with the uh, nationwide study that I showed a minute ago. Um, the, the precision is low, so it's not statistically different from zero, but there's certainly a hint of, a, of a, an effect early on. Um, and I would say that the majority of studies have seen such an effect. It's very hard to get enough matching and enough um, control for confounding to um, completely eliminate this effect early on, um, which shouldn't be there um, uh, if you're fully controlled for confounding. Apart from one thing, which I think uh, we should be careful of, and that is that we now know that people who have been previously exposed to COVID-19 or to SARS-CoV-2 make a very rapid and very, very high immune response soon after their first vaccination. So as prevalence of populations that are getting vaccinated grows, we would expect to see an increased uh, probably some evidence of effect in the very short term. Um, the, other, the other part that makes these, uh, us believe that these uh, findings are real is that, um, is that the viral load is lower, which would seem to be uh, less, less subject to confounding. Um, so we, we've observed a five-fold, uh, a five CT, which is two to the fifth or 30 97% uh, reduction or so in the amount of RNA present in the uh, fully vaccinated compared to the unvaccinated people um, uh, uh, 
who got um, who got infected. So to summarize this part um, uh, on the confounding area, with enough detailed data, we can control confounding in observational studies, and and we propose this novel use of a negative control approach to calibrate how you control confounding. Um, and the the sort of data science extract that I would take from that is that um, in most situations, data limitations on all three dimensions uh, that I mentioned before will make this hard, um, requiring a grain of salt for vaccine effectiveness estimates. But when, when it's possible to do it uh, with a lot of individuals, um, allowing very precise matching uh, based on a lot of detail, um, which also requires some history with those subjects, um, then you can you can make progress. So really all three dimensions become important uh, of big data in that case. Um, uh, in the infectiousness on the infectiousness question, um, uh, the the impact on infectiousness seems from this study and certainly many others now to be large but not perfect. Um, and I think here the key is to design the studies so that the vaccine effectiveness estimate um, is readily interpretable as a real infection or infectiousness outcome. But there's still more work to be done on the methods for that. Last, I want to talk about um, very fairly briefly about some work uh, I've had the chance to do with a group from the United Health uh, Insurer in, um, in the United States. Um, it's a it's a preprint. An old version is on MedArchive. It will be uh, out, I hope, soon in BMJ. It's been accepted. Um, and here the question is: What is the increased risk of for health events more than 21 days post diagnosis in a cohort of individuals who have had COVID? Um, so the the challenges here were that 2020 is an unusual year in every way, but especially in healthcare due to telemedicine, disruption of normal services, et cetera. Um, and the approach that we used here was to use multiple comparator groups uh, in order to get at the what we mean by increased risk. There's the problem of confounding, again, that risk factors for COVID diagnosis may also be associated with risk for these events. Um, and there we, again, dealt with it by a form of matching. Um, and then I think the last one, which we didn't fully deal with, but were we, uh, but I think everybody faces, is that long COVID is really about late onset of of new problems after the initial bout of illness, but it's also about persistence, and medical records don't typically code resolution of of a problem; they code uh, the presence of a problem, and so uh, there's a lot of potential for uh, misclassification, and I think we dealt with that um, in one way, uh, but but I don't know anybody who can deal with it perfectly. So I think that's a an area for further innovation. So this is a cohort of um, about a quarter million uh, SARS-CoV-2 diagnoses, about 2.9 percent of the insured population. Um, they were matched again based on a very uh, uh, high dimensional uh, a propensity score from a very high dimensional data set. And then um, they were matched separately for each of the outcomes that we were interested in um, because the, the entry criteria was that you could not have had the outcome in the prior, prior year. Um, so we were looking for new events. Um, and so that's a different group, slightly different group for each condition. The comparator groups were people who had not had COVID-19 diagnoses in 2020, so for the same time. Uh, people who had not had COVID diagnoses, which was anyone in 2019, so it was matching to someone like that person, but in 2019, um, and the same period of observation. Or someone who had had a viral lower respiratory infection, uh, according to, by, uh, as detected by an ICD code, um, in 2016 and eight to 18. Um, so the matching reduced the discrepancies between important um, uh, descriptors of these people 
uh, for example, the number of primary care visits uh, was much higher in the people um, who had a COVID diagnosis than in the general population that hadn't, but uh, by matching, we reduced that. Um, and similarly, uh, they tended to be uh, living in Hispanic or white neighborhoods um, more often um, uh, in this population, uh, but that was reduced by matching, et cetera. So this is the first result slide. Um, uh, these are um, recurrent event um, curves for primary care visits after their index date. Um, the, the hospitalized people in our cohort um, with COVID uh, are in green. The non-hospitalized uh, are uh, in yellow. Um, uh, if they were clinically diagnosed and people who had just a positive PCR are in red. And the comparator groups are here, uh, viral lower respiratory infection, which is similar to the PCR positives, um, and the, um, uh, the two uh, un unexposed comparator groups. Um, and so you see, of course, a, a dramatically increased uh, likelihood of uh, or rate of uh, attending the primary care um, following um, following the acute period of infection. Um, these are risk differences on the left and hazard ratios on the right for a number of conditions um, uh, comparing the SARS-CoV-2 diagnoses as a whole versus those who had not been diagnosed um, in 2020. Um, and you see elevated rates of hypertension, mental health diagnoses, arrhythmias, um, uh, and so these are these are the relatively common conditions that become more common with COVID. Uh, this is a hazard ratio, so this uh, this sees large proportional increases in rare diagnoses such as encephalopathy um, and the like. Um, and then interesting, I think, is to look at the at the actual Kaplan-Meier curves for these individual events. So um, in some cases, for example, hypercoagulability or um, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, so clotting uh, issues, um, they of course happen a lot during the acute period, uh, shown here in red for the, or, uh, shown here to the left of the yellow line for the, for the infected group. Um, they happen at an elevated rate if you have another viral over respiratory infection. Um, and they, uh, they don't happen very much if you don't. Um, but what's also striking is that this curve continues to uh, have a higher slope than the, than the controls um, over a period of observation up to 200 days. So there's a, there's, a, um, there's a continuing risk of new diagnoses of, uh, of these clotting issues. Um, uh, Respiratory failure, on the other hand, is uh, mainly something that happens acutely, and then uh, and then the uh, it continues to happen um, at an elevated rate. But the but the main risk is during the acute period. Um, and cardiomyopathy and encephalopathy are uh, uh, perhaps intermediate. Um, interestingly, with cardiomyopathy, there's it's really just another viral low respiratory infection. Well, uh, for encephalopathy, it um, is worse than a typical viral lower respiratory infection, um, and certainly a lot worse than not having it. And the last results are from, or to break it down by uh, age and gender, this is all in people under 65 um, from a commercially insured population, which in the US means that they're not on Medicare, so not 65 yet. Um, we are repeating this with Medicare, uh, and as you would expect, there's a small age effect within the under 65s, and, and we're seeing, of course, a much more dramatic effect in the, um, in the over 65s. Um, hospitalized disease puts you at considerably higher risk for getting post-acute outcomes uh, as well. Um, uh, as well. Um, having pre-existing conditions some, to some extent and gender not very much for most of them. Um, so in summary, there are a number of conditions that continue to occur past the first 21 days. Um, uh, for the more severe ones, these kinds of billing databases are a good way to learn about incidents in large populations. 
Um, we were more skeptical of the purely clinical and symptomatic diagnosis codes uh, and had a debate with the reviewers about whether to include them at all. Um, I think surveys may be one way of trying to supplement these database studies to get the details of timing and duration. Um, but of course, surveys uh, have the problem of, of quite selective response in many cases. Um, and again, uh, detailed matching allow, is, is dependent on having uh, all of these dimensions of large data um, to, to accomplish the matching and maintain power. So, and finally, in general conclusion, I think good decisions require good evidence. And there are several examples in COVID-19 where low quality of evidence has arguably hindered good decision-making. Um, COVID's huge age-dependent range of severity and other aspects of transmission, along with testing capacity limits have really made, uh, been the major limits on our quality of evidence. Um, I think big data along these three dimensions of individuals, time, and variables can often improve our evidence, but only in combination with careful study design. Um, and I would really push for innovations in finding better ways to get representative data uh, acquisition as inputs to all of our, um, all of our studies, because uh, otherwise we are um, in a difficult situation of not knowing really what's true at the population level.